we will have now the keynote for the day. Speaking will be Laureen uh, Jomé Palacy. And uh, she will speak about uh, the impact of algorithms, the social impact of algorithms and ethics about this. Um, her talk is blessed by the algorithm computer says no. Have fun. Um, good day, everyone. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm really excited to see how many people are doing different things in open source and the mess is really, it's really um, exciting. Um, I am the founder, one of the founders of um, a, a non-profit called Algorithm Watch. What are we? Uh, what do we do? Um, we're a non-profit and we're looking at algorithms and um, what we call ADM, automatic decision-making processes, um, from a social and ethical perspective. So we're not analyzing algorithms focusing on the toaster, uh, but algorithms that may have some sort of social relevance. This means that we develop um, strategies for auditing. This also means that we also work on um, ethical standards. And right now, uh, we are pretty much being um, um, harassed by the politicians and uh, the private sector asking us for advice. So we are uh, doing a lot of um, policy and uh, trying to create standards that are applicable to many different um, constituencies. Um, but uh, today I want to talk about the social impact of um, algorithms. Um, and, well, not algorithms, but algorithmic systems. And what, what do I want to talk to you about? Um, I, I first would like to talk about what's the state of the art right now. Why are we having this conversation on um, automatization back again, why this is having some um, um, special focus in both the public sector and also in um, in mainstream media. Then I would like to talk about what the status of the ethical situation is right now. Um, many of you might uh, follow the, uh, the news, many of you not, but right now regulators are in the middle of a discussion where um, they are trying to create not only standards but also um, laws that are going to shape the way you all can code or do your work for the next uh, 5 to 25 years. So um, this is a debate that matters. Um, you've had this situation before. This is not the first time that there's regulation ex explicitly explaining you which type of method you should use uh, when you do, for instance, in um, logistical regression for uh, financial scoring. Um, and then I would like to talk about um, the new part or the new dimension that we have right now through this new um, upgrade of technology of ADM that um, is sort of um, reaching a high peak of commercialization. And um, in the very um, the very end of, uh, of what I of, of the lecture. Uh, I would like to talk to you about behavioral challenges that we all have, data scientists, developers, um, all technicians involved in this type of processes have biases and the discussion about the biases and the challenges is not really being addressed from the behavioral perspective and I thought I would bring something practical into the debate because I think that those are aspects that um, are relevant for your work and uh, you might need to be aware of when uh, working on technologies that are commercial or are in the public uh, space and um, do shape society because right now you are the future of a new generation of regulators. You are regulating the world and the way it is being shaped. Um, so let's start with the state of the art. Um, why are we having this conversation everywhere about automatization, algorithms, uh, artificial intelligence, big data, and all these buzzwordings um, where no one really knows what they mean, but you see that people are really scared about that and concerned, spe specifically in Europe. Um, it starts with the fact that right now, because of the uh, new capacities that we have, um, we are um, starting to automatize on a more abstract level. It is way easier to automatize processes than ever before without having to be as concise as we used to be for, um, let's say, 40 years ago. Um, and um, 
this is uh, making some uh, concerns with regards of how uh, technology is being used with humans and um, this is bringing new reflections on what is the difference between the way machines work and what is the difference between um, how human beings think and use their thinking when working. So um, let's try to jump into the social scientist part of this uh, of this uh, talk. Um, in uh, 2016, um, Daniel Kahneman, perhaps some of you might have heard about him, he won a Nobel Prize and he's been writing this uh, bestseller, Fast Thinking, Slow Thinking. He uh, has been also shaping a lot of the debate about nudging. Um, and he came up with a new study um, that confirmed what we knew for over 60 years actually, um, which is that human beings are inconsistent are very inconsistent. Um, and in the jargon of the social scientist disciplines, um, inconsistency is called noise. Um, and what we realize in social sciences is that uh, inconsistency free environments are really difficult to, to make. You cannot have an inconsistent free environment unless it is very strict, very well defined. And uh, there is no possibility to have a human judgment in the process. Then you will probably have a inconsistency free um, system. But again, that's very difficult. Um, so this means that all sectors where there's a human decision being taken are impacted by the fact that there is inconsistency in human behavior. This means in medical, um, um, surgeons, uh, finance experts, project managers, judges, developers, C-level managers, data scientists, they are all affected by inconsistency. And they are actually um, on the very top of what is um, part of what the technology right now, um, the way the technology right now is being shaped. I will come to that after, that, um, in a few steps further. So, just to make a difference between inconsistency, human inconsistency, and bias. Um, those are two different things. And usually they take, they, they are usually confused, um, and uh, it is important to make a difference here. Um, when we talk about, um, about this consistency, we talk about a random behavior. So this is what you will see in figure um, B. You would see crosses everywhere. It just simply doesn't make sense. It's fuzzy. Um, when we talk about bias, we see that there is a consistent behavior behind that. It's just simply not in the way it is supposed to be. It's just simply deferring. Um, and how human beings usually behave is figure D, which is inconsistent and biased. So this means, actually, machines um, to take, so to say, um, to, 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 to make it a bit more clear, machines can be um, either really accurate or really biased. So they can be either A or C. They can discriminate consistently or they cannot discriminate consistently. While human beings are noisy, um, usually, and they're very seldom only noisy, um, otherwise they are uh, noisy and biased. That's the, the normal human behavior, even if we don't want to be that. Uh, to put some examples of the study, just to make you aware how how big this impact of inconsistency it has. Um, in the study that Cayman did, he was um, giving um, homework to different type of managers, developers, and all this stuff. And to software developers, they were given the task to make a time estimate for a task on two different days. On day one, they gave a specific um, estimation. On day two, they gave another estimation. And the deviation between those two estimations was 71%. 71%. There were other um, professions also being asked with this type of task, and it looks pretty much the same. It's a huge disparage, uh, and it really has to do with things that... Oops. Oh, I just took that away. Why? Why did I do that? Um, it really might have... 
um, no reason that should play a role. Uh, so this means that um, inconsistency has to do with the fact that there are external factors that should not play a role, but do play a role. Uh, it can be the weather, it can be the fact that you have not eaten, um, it can be the fact that your favorite soccer team lost last weekend, or it can be stress in the family. Um, and we know for a fact that this has been a crucial uh, factor m um, when measuring um, influences of um, judicial decisions. So, if you ever happen to be happen to be um, quoted by a judge or happen to have to go to court, make sure that you are that you have an appointment with the judge after eating on a sunny day. It's going to be better than if you have the appointment before eating. Um, so, just to sum up, to summarize, um, the bias, noise, difference. Um, they both have patterns, they both show behavioral patterns. And the differences really rely on the fact that um, when you have bias, there is some sort of knowledge that there is a concrete, correct answer. Um, so, meaning without uh, discriminating people of color, there is the knowledge or there is the conscience that, um, of course, that's not right, that there's another way to go with that. So, uh, you can identify it quite easily and you can measure it then accordingly. Noise uh, can be measured, but you don't need to um, understand what factors are creating that type of noise. You don't need to understand whether it's the weather that is creating noise or is uh, the fact that you have some familiar problems that is creating the noise. So that's, um, that's uh, the difference between the two of them. Um, and with that, um, what we can take away from that situation is that good decisions, good human decisions, are not only free of bias, but they are also consistent. Um, so a good ethical decision um, is not a machine decision, of course, since machines do not decide. There is no intention behind what a machine does. Um, but of course, what we see is that um, even though noise is more difficult to identify, it's easier to measure than bias. And um, monitoring algorithmic systems might help uh, to identify um, bias, human bias, and to help overcome inconsistencies. Um, on the other side, it can also help to amplify bias. It depends very much on the way how you uh, create these type of systems. Um, so what the discussion has realized when talking to different developers and looking at uh, different types of sys algorithmic systems is that um, we need to talk more about ethics. Um, developers have been focusing um, on um, sec bodily security when developing things, on very narrow ecosystems to understand um, what they are doing. And we've realized that there's a more wider impact of the technologies that um, was, has not been addressed. This has partly to do with the fact that, um, to a certain extent, there is a lack of um, knowledge on the human machine, human software interaction. We still need more knowledge about the real way how human beings interact with software. Um, and on the other side, um, it has also to do with the fact that many social scientists have shied away on um, addressing this type of issues um, because they are scared about the fact that this is a technological uh, dimension of social behavior and they are scared about this layer of technology um, within um, this type of um, applications. Um, so. When we talk about ethics, um, social scientists would rather concentrate not on the technology, but they would concentrate on the social uptake of technology. And uh, making that step uh, has uh, taken a lot of time. We are still having a discussion um, on how to do ethics when it comes uh, to technology. Uh, we are still discussing whether there is the possibility of shrine ethics in code, um, and this is part of the overview that I want to bring it to you. Um, not because I agree with all the um, points in the discussion that we're having, but because I think that you need to be aware of it, because this is when it's 
going to encounter you when uh, you're interacting with your customers or when you're interacting um, with um, other businesses um, demanding some sort of supply. Um, when we talk about ethics, um, there are like three levels of ethics. There's the meta ethic level, which is about um, the requirements for ethics. Uh, so um, it's more about what is the framework that is needed to decide what should be the principles, uh, the ethical principles that need to be applied for a specific situation. Normative ethics is more about the standards and principles, the concrete standards and principles. And applied ethics it really means pinning it down to a very concrete situation. So as you can see, the principles in ethics are very much context-oriented. They require context in the same way that a judge required requires context to understand um, how a detainee um, did something, for what motivation, for what reason, and so on. And that is the, different, the difference to technology. Technology does not require, does not understand, and is not able to contextualize. Um, I will come out to that thesis um, later on. Um, there are three approaches in the Western world when we talk about ethics. There are many other, uh, in other continents, in other parts of the world. Um, but when it comes to Europe and um, the US, um, we sort of uh, divide the way we do risk assessments and we shrine them in law uh, from three different types of perspectives. The first one is utilitarian ethics, which is more about the question of what type of output should I produce? So how do I produce the best outputs for all? The second one uh, might be even um, a contradicting one to the first one, so they might be incompatible, is the human rights-based approach. That approach does not look in the outputs, but in the inputs. So it's more about what obligations do I have? Uh, what things are prohibited uh, for the start? So that it doesn't matter what good outputs it would bring, this, because the inputs that I need to give in are prohibited. There's no way for me to do X. Um, and the third one is about virtue ethics. That is a very old form, very old school of doing ethics. A very, um, very much Aristoteles, a classic, Greek classic, which is about what type of human being do I want to be? Uh, what does my behavior say about my character? Um, and they all play a role um, right now in different standardization groups. So the IETF, the IEEE, the AIAB, but also st classical standardization communities like the DEAN community or the ISO community are thinking very hard about the creation of um, ethical standards for uh, specifically artificial intelligence. And they are looking at three things three type of approaches to create a catalog of questions on how to address automatization, uh, more sophisticated automatization. Um, and the debate is still uh, very much at the beginning. On the one side, we have professors um, like um, Amitai Etzioni, uh, and they are thinking about creating bots to monitor bots. So creating a sort of ethical bot that has a sort of oversight capacity over all other algorithms that are being deployed. So what he is demanding is that whenever you apply an algorithmic system anywhere, you should also create an additional monitoring algorithm that has some sort of ethical coding in it. And of course, uh, there are some uh, voices against this sort of argument. Um, the most classical one would be um, Aristoteles. He said in his Nicomachean ethic, the one that thinks that ethics, that justice can be codified in maths is an idiot. And those times, idiot man self-centered. Um, but still, it was meant to be um, an insult. Um, and of course, uh, the question is, how far can you codify um, questions that are more about deduction, questions that are more about contextualizing? And those questions, those type of um, 
aspects are aspects that are very much intrinsic to ethics. So um, the, the, the opposing parties say that it's almost impossible to try to enshrine ethics in data because that type of dimension is just not simply compatible with the inductive approach that we're having right now um, in the uh, new automatization techniques that we're using, be it machine learning or something else. Um, then we also have technique-oriented ethics, and that is really impacting a lot the European landscape. And when I'm talking about technique-oriented ethics, I'm talking a lot about data protection issues. We have principles like data minimization, purpose limitation, information duties, consent, ideas of collective privacy, and requests for algorithmic transparency, meaning without a protocolation or just displaying the algorithm. Um, and this is really, uh, very much contested on the other side. So we have a very strong contestation from both uh, countries from the southern uh, hemisphere uh, saying, well, uh, this principle, this technique oriented principle goes against actually um, democrat the democratic idea that law should be technology neutral. Because it's not about the technology, but it's about what society does out of that technology. And um, the problem is, and we can see it, for instance, with that minimization, and that is also my point, um, that you cannot use it for all contexts. An ethical principle is meant to be used for all contexts. Data minimization principle is good for your privacy, but if it's about discrimination, with data minimization, what you're going to do is that you're going to privatize discrimination. It's not going to be possible to show that you're discriminating because you don't have control groups to test whether you're discriminating or not. Um, so, um, in this discussion, we see um, that um, this discussion is ongoing, it's not ended, and um, there is, I'm at the high-level expert group on artificial intelligence of the European Commission, and we are right now um, creating um, ethical rules and uh, policy recommendations for the next 10 to 20 years, and we're still discussing these issues there. And the third approach, um, or the third column of uh, the um, actual ethical debate, it's a lot about information ethics. So it's about looking at how information is being processed and trying to uh, make arguments on controlling that sort of information. And this is also being discussed and being contested in the very same way um, as on the second column when we talk about technique-oriented um, forms of regulation or ethical um, standards. Um, so it's the belief that um, for specific purposes, uh, specific data categories should be prohibited or, or the belief that um, there are specific outputs that should be sorted out. Um, and of course the opposing view is that um, actually you need to know more about the context before you decide uh, what type of um, information restriction you apply. Um, now. Let's try to uh, go further with the way uh, we in ethics are trying to, um, to make sense of the new challenges that we're having by trying to address what is new about this automation debate. Um, at the very beginnings of automation, it was in the periphery. So it was the fabrics, the industry sector, it was part of the military sector, but um, the other type of automatization that we have in the commerce world was very restricted to opening doors, to bank accounts, of course, yes, that was complicated, but for many other things it was really very easy. Now, through the commercialization of um, technologies that um, are really permeating our everyday lives, um, things are getting more complicated because it's not anymore about regulating how you're um, operating in an industrial sector, but it's more about how you are operating when this type of technology is being used for um, social interaction, for information propagation, um, but also for medicine and for many other uh, things that have a really sensitive and direct impact in society. And um, until now, when we used to have a decision, it was um, from the law perspective and also from the ethical perspective, it was 
compared as as an action. So if you decide you're actually very uh, on the verge of doing an action, uh, and this is the way our how our law system operates. So what we have now is that um, with automatization, what we are doing is separating the point of decision from the point of execution. So the question of action in the way we think about in ethics, um, and with that meaning uh, being rational, if you act, you are in control of what you're doing. If you act, you know uh, that you have a reason for that. If, you're not act if you cannot give reasons for the way you're acting, then you're either um, sick or you have some sort of uh, mental um, disabilities. Um, and this is the way the law system tries to assess if you should be held liable for something or not. So it's rationality, being able to display and to control your own acts, and also to be free, the, so to say, the space of freedom that you have. Um, and when we look at these technologies, what we have at the very beginning is a team, uh, be it the mathematical expert developing the formula, then the coder, uh, in the very idealized world, the coder, so I'm, nowadays most coders just also use algorithms and develop algorithms. You have the data scientist, you have the manager that decides where this program, where this automatization system is going to be implemented in their own uh, company or in the public sector. And of course, you also have the expert within uh, that segment that is going to analyze the outputs that are given. So it's at least four to five different people that have a role and shape the way this um, system is being implemented. And there is even also a sixth actor, which is um, actually the broader um, for machine learning, for instance, for so to say bottom-up um, algorithmic systems. Uh, the, the so to say um, the community that is producing the data is also part of the shaper of this system, since those systems are really sensitive to what the data says. So this is confusing for the regulator, and this is confusing for many, because many of um, the regulators, but also many of the ethical community, like to put the blame exclusively on the developer, which is, of course, not fair. And this is one of the parts that um, also need to be addressed more and more within the community. Uh, depending on the state where the mistakes, the bias is found, um, there's of course not only the developer, the one to be held liable, but also the data scientist or also the person working in the specific department that has to do something out of the outputs. Um, and. Um, one of the things that we at Algorithm Watch, when we are looking at uh, ADM system, are realizing more and more is that in many, many cases, the problems that we see and the bias that we see does not even have to do with any technical aspect, but it's more and more about how the system is being integrated in a whole um, decision architecture. To put an example, and. a uh, 2000 years, so 2000, 2001, there was a new development in society that was the smart user. The smart user was a new profile in, in society due to the commercialization of the internet. So the smart user would go and compare different um, offers and then decide and buy one. That had a spillover effect in the, on those days, offline word, world. That person, um, would go to different places and compare. And there is a specific, very interesting case on those days uh, with regards to financial scoring. So the Sparkasse in Germany um, started, to realize, uh, started to have the following problem. Um, in the small cities, people would not go anymore to the Sparkasse where the whole family used to go. They would go to four to five different Sparkasse and they would ask for the conditions for a credit. And after asking two to three different sparkasses, the score would just be... And the reason for that um, was actually very simple, but it took very, very long the Schufa, so the biggest scoring company in Germany, and the sparkasses to find out where the problem was. Um, and 
it was not a technical problem, to be honest. Um, when the Sparkasse wanted to uh, offer conditions to the person reclining for a um, for a credit, they asked the Shufa about the score of that person, and the Shufa and the Sparkasse had not specified a two-step process for that. So for the Shufa, when the Sparkasse was asking, the Shufa was thinking, oh, this person got a credit and a second and a third and a fourth. And it took many years for them to realize because the algorithm was fine. They saw something in the data bank, but they didn't, couldn't come up with what's the problem. Uh, and it was not a middleware problem. So it took to get the managers together and say, please talk to each other. How do you do the process? So as you see, there are many, many reasons why um, we need to consider the ecosystem of responsibilities in a more broader way, because this is what we're seeing as an, on an everyday basis. Most of the problems that we have, it's about the human uptake of society, the work, the labor uptake, how these systems are integrated in the ecosystem, and also realizing that there are more than two to three people having responsibility for how this system is being deployed. So, um, a part of that, um, we also have challenges. We have, for instance, um, additional challenges um, as coders, uh, for instance, when it comes, or as mathematical uh, algorithmic um, designers. Um, for instance, the fairness paradox. I don't know if you heard about the Compass case. ProPublica had like this huge case last year. It was all around um, the algorithmic um, bias community. Um, there was a um, software program that helped um, judges to decide uh, whether they should give parole a detainee. Uh, so it was a risk assessment software. And um, in the end, a ProPublica came with, a, um, with an article stating that this risk assessment tool was very biased towards Afro-Americans. And uh, everyone was uh, was crying scandal. And North Point, the company that created that software, said, well, but we're not biased. We're doing this formula, and this is perfectly fine if you compare it according to our mathematical formula. Um, so it was the position of North Point towards the position of ProPublica, and they both had pretty fair uh, two different ways of measuring where the problem was. And they both were right. Because um, the problem with Compass and the problems with all algorithmic systems is that um, it doesn't matter um, how many formulas you create for fairness. And there are many, there are a few ones out there. Um, we have a problem when it comes uh, to getting all the fairness criteria together in one formula. You can either implement this formula with this specific criteria for fairness, you can implement this formula with this specific criteria for fairness, but there is no way to create a formula that is able to get together all different fairness factors. And um, this is some uh, research that Krishna Gumari is doing right now in a Max Planck Institute in Freiburg. Uh, he's trying to find out that formula. And it's going to be difficult, I guess. Um, but that, this is one of the paradoxes that we're having in the field. But there are many other paradoxes uh, that you probably know as uh, data scientists, coders, math um, experts. Sometimes you have paradoxes in the way you have to display um, the data that you're using. And depending how you display it, it might show um, a specific result and give the impression that things are a specific way. Um, we also have things like, for instance, predictive policing. Um, it's a good case to exemplify what I want to say. We have a new way um, of discrimination and which we have not been looking at as um, in the Mint community, but are, is well known to the a community of economists. Um, Right now, these technologies have a very collective way of addressing things. Algorithms do not know individuals. 
it is all about um, creating a formula that is an expression of the social. It is about the um, social idea of how individuals can be standardized. And um, when we use algorithmic systems, what we do with this sort of automatization is that we um, standardize processes. And by standardizing processes, we create a sort of infrastructure layer. And with that, um, there is a challenge to that. Um, because individuals are not aware that they are being part of automatization process that is nothing but personalized. Personalized feels from the user, from the consumer perspective, as a very individualistic process. While actually, from the technical perspective, it's quite the contrary. It's um, categorizing individuals into fine granular collectives. And there is a challenge there. Because when you're not aware that you're being categorized into a specific collective, then you cannot compare that part of that, that sort of collective to other ones. And this is what we're seeing from an architectonical perspective. For instance, with predictive policing. Um, there might be the possibility that there are specific collectives within the city that are being um, more over um, that are being more looked at than in other parts of the city. It might be because there's more data, or, or it might be because it's simply an amplification of your own data. Um, and the problem with that is that democracy does not understand collectives. The way your human rights data are given are individual. So there is a paradox here, because on the one side, the algorithmic systems do not understand individuals. On the other side, democracies do not understand collectives. And we have some friction here when it comes to redress. So if you um, are living in, let's say, what's a small, what's, if you're living in St. Augustine, um, and St. Augustine is being part of a smart city concept, con, con, concept that encompasses also Bonn. Um, let's assume that St. Augustine is less datafied than Bonn. What you're going to have is that specific collectives within St. Augustine are being treated differently than specific collectives within Bonn. And the possibility to show individual harm might be very difficult. Actually, we've seen cases where there is no individual harm, but you can see that different collectives are being treated differently and that, the, that this is being done in a non-legitimate way. And the harm produced is that you are harming the cohesion of a city, the cohesion of a society. But there is no way to point down to an individual harm that you can address before a court. A court. So this is one of the challenges that we're having right now. And this is one of the challenges that um, mint people um, need to address more. On the one side, the impact on an individual level. On the other side, from a more architectonical view, the impact on society and on different groups. Um, there are other challenges like uncertainty bias. Uh, you probably all know that. The fact that the less datafied or the less um, representative a group is, uh, the more difficult it is going to be for them to uh, be treated equally. So uh, let's assume that this is um, that we have a software for financial scoring. And the financial scoring software says that black people and white people should be treated equally. But let's assume that only 30% of the population is black. If the system is very sensitive, is very risk averse, so to say, because there is only 30% of the population that is black, the certainty um, for that part of the population um, is going to be less than the certainty that this machine is calculating for the whiter part of the population. So this means that black people are going to be given as uh, a credit um, less often than white people. Um, of course, there's the problem with historical data. Um, that's something that you probably are discussing many times. Um, and of course, there's the problem of one-sided criteria. Um, for instance, there's this case um, at a bank sector and the Australian government, so British Bank, 
um, bank entities and the Australian government decided that they wanted to have a diversity strategy and they created a recruitment software that um, was um, anonymizing um, all the CVs that they were getting. They were getting out uh, not only the gender, the age, the pictures, but also they were um, homogenizing the text so that you cannot infer out of the text whether this is a woman, uh, how old that person is, and so on. And they had to depose uh, um, that uh, software because it was not working. Um, and then when they started analyzing why, it came up that um, one of the criteria for um, for for uh, leading positions was leading experience. Leading experience. It's a one-sided criteria. It's a criterion that um, is very much given uh, within a specific community of white people. If they are male, they will have rather more experience on that sector. And the point there is that, of course, you need to think what you want to have as a criteria, and that's not the job of a developer. That's the job of the manager that is just giving you the specification for the software that you're supposed to calculate. But this might be also something that you might, when working in the sector, also address to the manager that is giving you the demand. Uh, because, of course, there's many type of criteria that can help to understand whether a person has leading qualities, leadership qualities or not. Leading experience, leadership experience, is just one of many other criteria that you can use to measure that. Um, and of course, um, mathematical formulation of fairness, as addressed before, um, in the case of Krishna Grimadi, play a role. Um, also, one-sided hardware and one-sided training sets uh, play a role. Uh, perhaps you know uh, Joy Bolamovini. Uh, she is the lead of the Data Justice League, and she was the one that um, realized that uh, the um, uh, software for uh, face recognition being used by IBM by Microsoft and by Facebook and a few other companies was uh, not able to identify two things. Um, women, uh, or were less accurate when identifying women, and different skin color types. So Asians had a better uh, average in being recognized, but still in comparison to white people, it was a huge um, uh, divergence there. And there were two reasons for that. On the one side, of course, the training data sets, but on the other, uh, this is something that has to do with the way hardware was created. Um, and this is the reason why, for instance, iPhone decided to change the infrared lightnings that they were using so that they can now, um, um, ha with the lightning, they are able to uh, capture all types of skin color. Um, there's an additional change. Um, there's an, an additional challenge, which is the calling rich dilemma. Um, when we um, create something in the European Union specifically, we work under the precautionary principle. This is the reason why many people go to the US to develop things, because they work with the cost and benefit analysis. So in the US, if you want to develop something, you just develop it, you go to the market, and there is some sort of harm, they're gonna be, you are going to need to do modification. The precautionary principle in the European Union demands from you to really test and prove that the harm that is going to be produced by what you're doing is very small, and that there is specific um, provisions for that. But the problems that you have with that is that um, you cannot foresee what the technology is going to do unless you start deploying it and using it. And the more, um, the more uh, security provisions you put in the technology at the very beginning, the less controllable it is going to be in the very end of it. And this is something that you will know, I don't need to tell you that. Uh, but this is one of the main challenges for the regulator in the European Union because this is not the way how they are used to regulate. Um, but one of the biggest challenges that we all have, and this is the part that I want to address that has to do with you, are behavioral challenges not only in the human uptake of technology, but also on the human programming side of technology. 
you all, we all have biases, and there are different types of biases. There are information biases, um, and there are different types within this type of um, information biases that play a role in the way you code, in the way you decide how you want to address a problem. So let's start by addressing a few of them. And this is the part where I want to make you aware of all this. Um, human behavioral um, factors that play a role, not only in your work, but in the work of many other people. This is just simply uh, something that seems to be inherent in the human nature. One of the what we call information biases is the so-called reasoning by analogy. Um, this means using very simple analogies uh, for complex contexts. You usually hear it uh, in the mainstream media when everyone talks about cars to make an analogy of how cars are going and to analyze and to use that analogy for, let's say, um, diagnostics in medicine. It just makes no sense. But this type of analogies are being used very often. And the problem with that is that you focus on a specific information and forget to look at other information because you're too much concentrated on the analogy. Um, so it's good to have someone from the outside um, that has the job to contest that analogy. Um, then there's also the illusion of control, and that has a lot to do with um, also human nature. Um, overall, we are all very narcissistic, and we um, once we have some sort of success in the what in what we do, we tend to self overestimate ourselves. And this means that you, as an expert, focus rather on what you think you can control and look less on the factors that are uncertain. And with that, your uncertainty risk management goes down the low. Uh, and with that, um, one of the things that you can do when you're creating some sort of um, strategy on concept is really try to address both what is controllable and what is my management, what is my strategy for the uncertainties that I have. Um, there are also um, other information biases like escalating commitment. This means that once you've dis taken a decision, even though um, you see that the product that you decided yourself for is uh, not working, you will stick to that decision. Um, irrespectively of the rationality behind that. Um, there's also the bias of the single outcome calculation. This means that you look only for the outcomes that are most probable, and with that you kill creativity, because the uh, creativity is less probable and it's not being used within your own um, range of possibilities that you want to uh, contemplate. And of course, they are... Um, Cognitive biases, meaning with that, uh, the way you define and restrict a problem is a moment of bias. The way you select the criteria is also a moment of bias. We see and we know that um, people prefer quantitative data over qualitative data. We see that people prefer visual data over arguments. We see also that um, when we create um, rational arguments and rational um, factors to constrain the system that you are creating are not being challenged because they are rational, so there is no meta-reflection at that level. Those are um, all biases that are very much seen, or that we are seen, um, within data scientists, within developers, but also within the part of the demand that is asking from you um, to create a system. Um, then there's also what we call um, um, risk biases. Risk biases has to do with the way you define risk, the way you, um, your attitude towards risk looks like, and the way you deal with risk. And um, also, you see, I'm, I'm using quotes from, uh, from, from um, studies that are pretty old. Uh, we, we know from quite a long time that this is the way human behaves. Um, it's interesting, to, for instance, to see that uncertainty about positive outcomes is not seen as a risk. 
only uncertainty about negative outcomes is seen as a risk. We also see that um, risks are evaluated not in real life, in terms of magnitude, but not probability. That is interesting because we have assumed that the way we calculate risk has to do with an equation between magnitude and probability. But the real um, the reality of risk assessments in the market uh, with you is that you are looking at magnitude, you're not looking at probability, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and the most interesting thing that sort of palliates all the two other aspects mentioned before is that when it comes to reducing risk, trying to reduce risk into a measurable uh, single formula is not in your radar, which is good because it should, you shouldn't. Um, when it comes to the question of dealing with risk, um, um, no, sorry, <laughs> towards attitudes uh, to risk, um, it's interesting because senior manager developers, the ones that are on the top, on the higher hierarchy, they think that uh, taking risk is part of their job. So if you're a junior, you're not going to think like that. But if you're a senior, you are going to think that this is what you are actually expected to do. And the interesting thing is that there's a disparity between what you think you're expected to do and your self-perception, because what we're measuring is that they are more risk averse than they think. And of course, it also has to do with how you're operating. If you're very close to the target that your uh, employer has given you, um, you won't risk too much because you're overperforming. Um, if you're operating over the agreed goals with your employer, you're going to risk more. You're going to be you're going to tend to risk more to achieve that. Um, and when it comes with dealing with risk, we see two things that are interesting. Um, most of you think that um, risk means, risk taking means about controlling it. Um, everything else is gambling, or you define it as uh, gambling. And that's an interesting approach to the way uh, one thinks about risk taking. And um, the thing that you tend to do is to include control strategies. But including control strategies leads to, to the information and cognitive biases that I was mentioning before. So that's a challenge. Um, and then at the very end, there's another thing that is uh, also causing pain in the way how developers and data scientists and so on are uh, creating technology, which is what we call the uncertainty biases. Um, there is, what, what is an uncertainty bias? Um, the uncertainty bias is the difference between what you think that you need to know to take a decision and the information that is available. And the interesting thing is that the more information available there is out there, the worse you're going to take a decision. That sounds uh, counterintuitive, but that's the case. We've been measuring this for over 18 years. Um, so the more information they have, the worse you're going to decide. I'm sorry for that. Um, so this means that there are two aspects when it comes about uncertainty bias that you need to think of. One is information. Um, th five minutes, thank you very much. Um, decision makers um, do like to have information presented in a digestive manner. So uh, if you uh, only give an Excel sheet, uh, it's not going to be as digestible as if you present graphs and some sort of visualization. And that is usually helpful to make a better decision. Um, but there is also uh, what we call the information fatigue syndrome. And that is um, creating lots of uncertainty within the community, because it has to do with the fact that you get so much information that you become uncertain, not only about what decision to take, but also about what information you need. So this is also a, um, this is also an, an aspect that is challenging the way we human beings are um, working and deciding, and not only as managers, um, explicit, um, creating the demand for you developers, but also you developers and data scientists and um, algorithmic people. Um, and this is one of the 
challenges that um, are always going to be there. There is no way to get those bias out of the system. There is no way to create an algorithm to get those bias out of the system. There is some way of trying to create an oversight mechanism with some sort of standardization. But the only way to address those issues is by simply being aware and by simply making sure that you have a team of people that are looking from very different perspectives. And also making sure that you not take responsibility for decisions that are not on you to take, but on the manager or the data scientist or other colleague. Um, and with that, um, I will say be aware of your bias and thank you very much for listening.